Hello, I'm in the workshop today. I'm going to be making a, a frame for my wife Nancy to hold one of her abstract works. And uh, she goes for a particular kind of frame that's modern. It's called a floater frame, so-called because when there's a uh, picture installed in it, it leaves a, a gap all around that has, uh, and so that the picture has no visible means of support. And the construction is fairly simple. It's really just uh, the sides in this case are about uh, two and a half inches high and the face is about half an inch wide. And the outside board is pretty much uh, square except it's had a small rabbit cut into one back corner, inside back corner of it in which this filler piece sits. And it's that filler piece that will support the picture because of uh, screws drilled from the back. It's relatively easy to make. I have a few uh, points that I finesse, uh, but let's get started. I'm going to be using walnut and basswood as my components. Uh, both of these elements come from a mill in Los Angeles and are sent to me. First I need to make a 45 degree cut on the first end of each piece. Then I'll be measuring it. In this case I want it to be a half inch longer than the artwork itself on the interior dimension. This will give me a quarter inch gap all around. I'm using a white Prismacolor pencil here just because it's easier to see against the walnut. So then I'm flipping the saw to the other side, the other 45 degrees, and cutting the opposite end. I'll then need to make a duplicate piece. For accuracy, I have a guide block on my fence that will ensure that the second piece is identical to the first. And I'll compare these two pieces by laying them together on the table and actually feeling with my fingers that they're identical. Now I just need to make the other two pieces for the alternate sides. The saw I'm using here is really overkill for this task. I uh, own it because I do other woodworking. But a relatively inexpensive miter saw with a good sharp blade in it would also work quite well. I'm using walnut because I'll be staining this rather than painting it. If uh, I was going to paint it, I'd use a less expensive type of wood. It always pays to lay out the pieces in their correct orientation before going ahead. First I want to make the joints that will create two L's. I have a jig here that can act as a, another pair of hands if I need it, but in truth all that's really needed is a perfectly square block of wood. I found that uh, putting the glue on and then waiting about a minute, minute and a half lets the glue get aggressively tacky and that helps me when I pull them together. With these small dimensions, I can just hold the pieces together until they look good and then fire a couple of uh, pins into the joint to hold it. I'm using a pneumatic nailer and very thin wire brads that have virtually no head. These pins will effectively hold the joint together while the glue sets up. And I'll give the glue at least an hour to set up so that they'll be strong enough to bear the stress of my pulling together the second two joints. I'll even let these first two glue joints sit overnight if there's enough time.
The blocks you see are just lifters to hold everything up to the same level as my jigs. I could just as easily have these down on the flat of the table and that would work fine too. It's really a pleasure to have a large work surface like this. I don't know of any substitute for that. Then it's time to pull together the second set of joints to complete my rectangle. I keep a jar of water and a rag nearby to clean up any squeeze out or stray glue that gets on the table. The glue joint will be quite strong, but if I was relying on these nails to hold the joints together, I might choose a heavier finish nail that comes out of a different gun. But I'm planning to reinforce these corners with splines. It's just an option. It makes a joint that's incredibly strong and uh, gives me some peace of mind. Here's a little device I made that uh, mimics the opposing piece in the corners because now I'm going to be putting on the backer piece. This ends up being a back and forth procedure where I cut one end and then approximately cut the other. But I kind of sneak up on a perfect fit going back and forth to the saw. For the last fractions of an inch, I use a hand plane on this jig to take off tiny slivers. If I fail to get a perfect cut from the saw, this step should resolve it. After I've got a piece that perfectly fits one side, I'll uh, run a bead of glue in the rabbit, put the backer piece in place, and then fix it with my nailer. It's important to be vertical because I'm nailing into just a quarter inch. After that, it's just a matter of uh, doing these backer pieces one by one, trimming them, make sure they're exact, uh, running the bead of glue, tacking them in. It takes a little while, but it's not difficult. Sometimes I'll make these cuts just with a handsaw and a miter box. It's easily done. A lot of these other things I have are just conveniences. But I do love my nail guns. There's a small air compressor off screen. wasn't too expensive. It only comes on when more pressure is needed because it has a tank attached to it. I also put glue on the end of each of these uh, pieces so that there'll be glue in the miter of them too. It's probably not essential, but I do it anyway. Here I'm taking a moment to carefully lay out where I'm going to put the holes in the back of the backer strip to accept the screws that will be going through the back and into the frame of the painting panel. I just space these out at intervals equidistant from ends so that it looks neat. I use a drill that already has a countersink in the combo so that it's just a one-step process.
I want the head of the screw to be flush or below the level of the back of the assembly when I'm done. And there it is, all put together. Next comes my optional step, which is a method I use to reinforce the corners of these narrow frames. And I use a biscuit joiner on this jig I've made to cut a slot in each corner. And then I fill that corner with a spline set diagonally through the slot and glued in place. And when this is cured, the joint will be extremely strong, virtually impossible to break. This is a jig I made up based on a online plan. I'll, I'll try to put this in the video notes. It goes rather quickly, actually. And the spline is just a narrow piece of wood that I cut into triangles. And you can see that after they're glued in, they are immovable. And the next step is to simply cut them as close to the corner as possible. I'm using a Japanese saw there. And then uh, take down the little bits left with the plane and or sanding. I like using the plane to get very, very close and then the rest will be taken out with the sanding I do, which will now be of the entire frame. And while I'm doing this, I, I round over all the sharp edges, uh, front face, corners, back edge, uh, just because it'll make them more pleasant. Uh, actually, if you leave a corner sharp, you can actually uh, injure somebody. And when that's done, I go over the entire thing with a tack rag, which is really just some cheesecloth that has sticky varnish on it. And after this, it goes very quickly. The stain will go on in just a matter of minutes. And I'll let this dry for several hours and overnight if there's enough time. In our workflow, this is uh, usually my job nearly finished. Nancy will now be painting the inside face and backer board with black acrylic and then taping it off in preparation for making a gold front face. She applies an adhesive to the front face and gives it a little time to set up. After that, she'll be laying down strips of the gold foil. It's actually a colored aluminum and uh, rubbing and burnishing it on. After all the gold's on, she likes to go over it with a cheesecloth to remove any loose flakes and do a final burnishing. Then it's back to the workshop to put on a couple light coats of shellac This will seal the metal foil on the face and give the stained walnut a little bit of a sheen and some depth. After everything's dry, it's just a matter of dropping the artwork into the gap and centering it in the frame. For this, we use cardboard spacers and strips of paper. Then it's just a matter of pre-drilling some pilot holes and sending home some screws through the back and into the frame of the painted panel. And that's it. We're done. Thanks for watching. If that was helpful to you, I hope you'll consider hitting the like button and maybe subscribing to the channel. Don't forget to visit jamescrandall.com. Take care.